There are over 35,000 museums within the United States, welcoming over 850 million visitors each year. Did you ever wonder what goes on behind the scenes in museums, creating the displays and exhibits we all enjoy? Join us as we explore museums and their exhibits from the inside out. Hi, I'm Leslie Mueller. Welcome to Museum Access, the show that takes you to America's top museums to talk to the experts. Then we go behind the scenes to learn even more. We're in Chicago at the McCormick Bridge House and Chicago River Museum on Michigan Avenue and Wacker Drive. This landmark five-story bridge house is filled with stories about the dynamic relationship between Chicago and its river. Construction for the Michigan Avenue Bridge began in 1918, and it was open to the traffic in 1920, serving as a gateway between the city's north side and south side. Today, we'll explore the Chicago River and its world-famous movable bridges. We'll take a closer look behind the scenes at the bridge works that actually lift this mighty bridge approximately 40 times a year, allowing boat traffic to pass through the heart of the city. We'll also learn the story of the Chicago River and its wildlife and the vital role it played and continues to play in the development of this great city. So are you ready to take a look at an engineering marvel close up? Let's go. Margaret, this is one of the more unique museums that we have visited. It is stunning. Let, let's talk about the architecture and just... Well, we're delighted to have you here. The, our museum is in a bridge house right downtown on the Chicago River. And it's one of the most historic places in Chicago where Fort Dearborn was. And it's just this amazing intersection of the river and the city and the history of Chicago. So the bridge houses were here at the very beginning. Yeah, the bridge houses um, were part of the the Burnham plan. So when they extended Michigan Avenue, and actually when they created Michigan Avenue, part of it was the bridge itself. So that was 1920. And since then, you know, the area has grown up around us. This site used to be one of the busiest ports in the whole entire world. So it would have been lumber and grains, all kinds of things moving through the city. And now, of course, we have Chicago's stunningly beautiful skyline and our Bridge House Museum. Well, and it's so cool to be able to go up as a five flights of stairs and you it's a vertical museum for sure. That's right. So we it's it's designed around this the story of history, right? So as you move from the top and from the bottom up to the top of the museum, we move through time and we tell the story of how the river changed and how people's use of it changed, right? So it's the pre-permanent European settlement to the you know to its bright future where we're all going to be swimming in the river together. Well, and I remember as a child there was not as much activity down at the river. It certainly has come alive. Yeah, and Friends of the Chicago River, I mean, that's core to our mission and why we have this museum is to tell the story of the changing health of the Chicago River system. Frankly, when Friends of the Chicago River was founded in 1979, there was sewage in the river on average every three days. And of course, as you can tell from being here and seeing the kayaks, the tour boats, the river walk, that there's so much happening and the river is so much cleaner and so much healthier than it used to be. Actually, the color of it, I was amazed. It almost looks like tropical. Caribbean waters. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny that depending where you are, the river's color changes. It also changes with the weather. But, you know, we have the sky, we have lake water, we have the reflections of the buildings. And what we don't have here, which we would have in other parts of the river, is tannins from the forest and leaves. Like you could have leaf litter at the bottom of the river, and that would actually impact the color and make it look browner. Oh, that's um, interesting. You know, so there's yeah. a lot of different factors that influence the colors, but it you know, some days it looks like a watercolor and it's just beautiful yes. today. So let's talk about how the health of the river has changed the activities on the yeah, river. So the river itself, um, you know, frankly, even 20 years ago, it was surprising to see people in canoes and kayaks. So friends really pushed for kayak launches and places where people could access the water, knowing that if we get people on the water, they're going to start to want to fight for the health of the river. So what we see today are people in jet skis. We see canoes and kayaks. We see kids rowing uh, racing shells. Get, I mean, people get college scholarships rowing on the Chicago River, something that was unimaginable just a few decades ago. And so we're really excited about the change and how people have really embraced the river and how they use it. 
And what about outreach to, do school groups come to the river or do they, they come to the museum, I'm assuming? Absolutely, so we do a ton of programs. So Friends works through on the ground projects that actually physically change the river and, and help demonstrate what's possible. We do long-term policy work, so working on water quality standards, you know, the legal proceedings that you govern yeah. health, right? But then on an ongoing basis, we wanna build support and awareness and a stewardship ethic. So really making people care about the river. So we have a Chicago River Schools Network where we have literally 16 to 17,000 students a year, most of them Chicago public school kids who go on field trips, they learn about the river, and they learn how to be advocates for the environment within their own communities and as a whole. And so they come to the museum, they go on field trips, they you know put on waders and go out into the river and oh, see what fun. lives there. Oh, I yeah. would love that. Yeah, so yeah. really some great activities that provide them new experiences and a new way to learn about what they, you know, environmental health and science sure. and nature. Well, let's talk about the wildlife of the river. How has that been impacted as it's cleaned up? Well, you know, the wildlife is really fun. We have had so many wonderful stories. So, you know, scientifically you can measure it. Um, you know, in the 1970s, there were only seven species of fish in the river, super tolerant of pollution. Now there's over 75. We did a fishing promotion a few years ago to show people, hey, where you can fish on the water. And a five-year-old caught an American eel this big. An and everyone eel? was like, an eel. Oh my gosh. I mean, it was really exciting. That is a big deal. And yeah. just recently we had a tiger muskie found in the river. We've got, you know, gar, all, you know, just the river is alive with fish, but it's also alive with turtles and muskrats and beavers and, you know, hundreds of species of birds use the river. And we see great blue herons and state endangered oh black hound night herons who are fish eaters, right? So they're a symbol of healthy water. And one of the things that's most exciting with wildlife is we're starting to see the return of otters. So Whoa. river otters swimming in the river, they're highly mobile, so it can't be like just wait, you know, you can't go to a forest preserve and hang out and wait for an otter. We do know that otters are present in the river because there's researchers at the forest preserves of Cook County who have done a lot of study to find them. And so it's just a really good symbol of clean water yeah. and healthy habitat. New life. One thing I notice about this museum is you're really telling the story of the river and the movable bridges. It's yeah. so unique. Yeah, you know, it's interesting when we were designing the museum, you know, Chicago is here because the river's here. The people that were in Chicago, they were real pioneers. And we have in Chicago more patents for bridges than any other place on the planet because we had this busy, busy downtown, busy, busy river, and the bridges needed to go up and down quickly and efficiently. And so when you tell the story of Chicago, you have to talk about the river and you have to talk about the bridges because it's all related. Josh, first of all, we couldn't have a more gorgeous day in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Of course, <laughs> yeah, I, I control the weather, so thank welcome you to Chicago. Much, yes. Thank you for thank you for coming down here. And to have this as a backdrop, this bridge is unbelievable, and I want to learn more about the bridge system in Chicago. But let's talk about this one while we're here. Yes, so this is the Dusable Bridge, okay. formerly called the Michigan Avenue Bridge. This bridge was built in 1920, so it is 101 years old in 2021. Yeah. This bridge was changed to the Du Sable Bridge in 2010, and it's named after Jean-Baptiste Point Du Sable, who was the first non-indigenous uh, settler in Chicago. Oh. He actually had his dwelling right across the river here, where the Apple Store is today. Jean-Baptiste Point Du Sable is regarded as the first permanent non-indigenous settler of what would later become Chicago, Illinois. He is recognized as the founder of Chicago. Pointe de Sable was of African descent, but little else is known of his early life prior to the 1770s. During his career, the areas where he settled and traded around the Great Lakes and in Illinois country changed hands several times among France, Britain, Spain, and the United States. Described as handsome and well-educated, Pointe de Sable married a Native American woman, and they had two children. In 1779, during the American Revolutionary War, he was arrested by the British on suspicion of being an American patriot sympathizer. 
Pointe de Sable is first recorded as living at the mouth of the Chicago River. By 1790, he had established an extensive and prosperous trading settlement in what later became the city of Chicago. He sold his Chicago River property in 1800 and moved to the port of St. Charles, where he was licensed to run a ferry across the Missouri River. Pointe de Sable's successful role in developing the Chicago River settlement was little recognized until the mid-20th century. Let's talk about the, the different bridge houses that I see. I see four of them on the corners, and then we'll get back to the bridges, but what's yes. their purpose? So every movable bridge has a bridge house, and okay. the bridge house, the purpose of it is to hold the tender equipment. So the bridge tender is the person that actually controls the bridge moving up and down for oh. boat traffic or barges. This bridge has two bridge houses that control the bridge opening. There's one across the river and there's one across the street. Okay. So there's two of them that control. The other two are strictly for ornamental purposes. Okay, for balance and symmetry. For symmetry. They're gorgeous. So the architecture style of this uh, bridge is in the Beaux Arts style. Okay. And the Bart style of architecture really values symmetry. So that's why there's four of them. And the bas relief on each one of them are gorgeous. I mean, they I see people stopping and taking pictures. And it's a very, it's a great selfie location. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> bas relief is the type of carving or sculpture in which figures are raised a few inches from a flat surface to give a three-dimensional effect. The four bridge houses on the Michigan Avenue Bridge provide a canvas for bas-relief sculpture, showing pivotal moments in Chicago history. The arrival of French explorers James Marquette and Louise Joliet. The first settlers Jean-Baptiste Pointe de Sable and John Kinsey. The Battle of Fort Dearborn. the rebuilding after the 1871 Chicago fire. These bridge houses proudly stand where Michigan Avenue crosses the Chicago River, one of the most iconic urban spaces in the world. So when they do open, Josh, I mean, they're not opening every, every day, are they? No, no. Okay. So the bridges on the main stem and the south branch of Chicago only open uh, on a schedule that oh. is determined by the city of Chicago these days. Oh, okay. That was changed in 1995. Mm. So prior to that, these bridges would open on demand and that would oh be up to 3,000 times a year. And you can imagine the, the, traffic. the traffic that that would <laughs> cause. So after 1995, it moved to a schedule that's set by the Chicago Department of Transportation. Oh. And really the only reason that these bridges open these days is for the sailboats that are coming in and out of Lake Michigan. Oh. Okay. All and right. that happens in the spring and the fall. So in the spring, all the boats are downstream and they're coming up through oh, yeah. the river system all the way out to Lake Michigan, spend all summer out at Lake Michigan or okay. wherever else they want to go. there's marinas out there. There's marinas. I see. Okay. Some of them go to the other Great Lakes. And then in the fall, they all come back in. Okay. And, uh, so they and open, go into and the they marinas open downstream. One at a time? Are they opening? Oh my God. Yeah, one at a time. So it's really a an amazing feat Process. of engineering yeah. because these bridges open quite quickly. So the team from the city of Chicago will leapfrog from bridge to bridge. Okay. So as one team is opening one bridge, the other team is getting the next one ready. I see. So okay, say our sense. bridge is about to open. Yeah. The next team is at the next bridge getting okay. it ready. All right. Yeah. The bridges were opened, I'm sure, in the past for different reasons. The river was used for different reasons. Was there product coming up the river? Or now it's just leisure, it seems. It's but... mostly leisure these days, but this river is still a working river. Okay. So there are barges, oh, there's wow. uh, cement factories that are At adjacent the to the river. Okay. So there are quite a few barges along with all these tour boats and kayaks and jet skis and all these other things that are along. So it's both a recreational river, a working river, and also this river is full of fish and wildlife. So it has all of these Teaming. teams yeah. working together to yeah. make it really this vibrant place to be. Let's talk about the structure of the bridge. Are, are they all the same? They are not all the same, oh, but okay. many of them are bascule bridges, which is now called the Chicago style bridge because oh, wow. it was kind of a Chicago innovation to have a bascule trunnion bridge. 
we can talk about what that means when we go inside the gear room. Yeah, and I'm more anxious depth. to go behind the scenes there. Yeah. yeah. But basically, what, what does it mean as far as the structure that we see? Yes, so this bridge is actually very special. It's the first of its kind. So oh. it's a double leaf, double deck, bascule trunnion bridge. Whoa. That's a lot of words. Say that fast five times. <laughs> so <laughs> let me go through those one by one. So double leaf means that there's two leaves that can open on each side. So oh, okay. each one of these sides can actually open independently of each other. Oh, okay. Double deck means that there's two layers. So you can see two layers of vehicular traffic that okay. can go on this bridge. And bascule bridge is a French term meaning nice. something like seesaw, which oh. means that it's um, it's uh, tilts kind of. It kind of tilts, kinda, yeah. 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 So it works. Like it works okay. via like a counterweight balance. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and the trunnion is the pivot point. So it's the round point that the entire bridge is resting on. Oh, wow. So those combined are double leaf, double deck, bascule trunnion bridge, and this is the first one of those in the world. We are standing on the river level, which is our first floor of the bridge house. This bridge house is five stories, so you can go all the way up to the fifth floor. This floor starts you out at pre-settlement history. So it will give you the story about the indigenous people that lived here, how the city was formed, uh, why it attracted more people over time. And then as you move up the museum, you go through time. So it's laid out chronologically. So as you go all the way up at the very top floor, you'll learn all about the modern river today and what exactly is going on with its Renaissance and the, uh, the cleaning of the river, uh, how organizations like Friends of the Chicago River have really worked to uh, make this river a place where people want to be on it and next to it and live near it. So the museum will really take you through time. And as you go, you get really great views through all five floors of the museum. And at the top floor, you get these 360 degree views of the city where you can never really get that kind of view anywhere else in uh, this part of downtown Chicago. This is our master switch. It is also known as an auxiliary drum controller. This machine can back up the bridge's operations in a remote controlled system. By operating and closing the magnetic switches, the master switch operates the rear locks, center locks, and main motors in a proper sequence. It is a type S reversible drum manufactured by Westinghouse circa 1920.
So here at the Bridge House Museum, we're lucky enough to have been left five pieces of vintage bridge tender equipment. These five artifacts are part of the original electrical equipment that operated the Michigan Avenue Bridge, which is of course now called the DuSable Bridge. These five pieces of equipment are the manual controller, the meters, the bench board, the center lock controller, and the master switch. Today, the five pieces of electrical equipment that were left behind at the museum are evidence of the best technology of the 1920s. So we are in our gear room, which gives you an up close and personal look at these giant gears that are over a hundred years old. Over a hundred years yep. old, these have been functioning. Exactly. It's they unbelievable. Were, they were all made and manufactured in 1920 when this bridge was built and they're all wow. original. Wow. Yep. And so these are still working, obviously, you know, every year. What do they have to do to, what do they do? Do they grease them or they oil them or what do they? Yeah, so it's actually quite efficient. So they don't have to do much to get this bridge moving. The way that these bascule bridges work is they work off of a counterweight system. So okay. that essentially means that they work via balance. Um, so you can see behind me that there's this giant counterweight that's labeled and it is 12,000 tons of steel and concrete that is all moved by these gears. Okay. which are operated by a 108 horsepower motor. So if you think That's of- it? Yes, so it's a tiny motor. It's about yeah. the size of, if you think of like a car, like a Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah, right, so right. So a right. tiny car can operate 12,000 tons of, <gasps> of a bridge, which is Whoa. amazing. Yeah, no, it yeah. is. And I'm seeing the counterweight. And then what is it? Is that pinion? What is yeah, that? so there, there's a few different there's a few different pieces of this bridge that are really important. So of course there's the counterweight, which sure. drops about 40 feet underground Ooh. whenever it's moving. There's the pinion gear, which is that ungreased gear in the back, and that's the, the final gear I call it usually, and that's the gear that actually pulls down the ladder-like structure on the bridge called okay. the rack, and that pulls the bridge all the way down on okay. this side. Whereas when this side goes down, of course the other side on the other side of the trunnion which is the pivot point. Okay. Everything on the other side of the trunnion goes up. So think about- So it's about, that teeter-totter that you like talked about. Kind of like yeah. a seesaw, yeah, yeah, exactly. So everything that the people see outside of the Bridge House Museum is the other side of this. I so see. So the, uh, the long leaf of the bridge that goes up into the air um, while the counterweight goes underground. And it's pretty and then, simple, actually. What is the, the trunnion is what we're seeing behind us here, right? Correct, yes. I the see a ladder going up. Yep, exactly. Yeah. So the ladder, of course, would just be for service. I see. Uh, but the trunnion is what the entire bridge structure is resting on. So that's the pivot point. So think of the, the middle of the seesaw. The balance of this bridge is so incredibly important. Everything is about the counterweight and the other side, the leaf of the bridge. Mm -hmm. So this bridge is really operated via balance. The gears and the motors get it going. But as soon as those get it going, everything kind of works on its own. So the bridge is so incredibly balanced that even a small little change in the structure or the paint job even can throw that balance off enough that it won't work correctly. A so layer of paint can even do a, that? Even a brand new layer of paint on wow. the bridge can throw off the uh, calibration of the bridge. Yeah. So the city of Chicago workers will have to go in after they paint it or after they uh, do some maintenance on the bridge and recalibrate it in order to get it to work correctly. It's really quite interesting how such a small change can actually just throw off the calibration that much. And such a massive, you know, structure. It's massive, What, yes. what about temperature? Because there's such extreme temperatures here in Chicago. That is, that is certainly a thing in Chicago is extreme <laughs> temperatures. So uh, for instance, in the summer, it can get quite hot. Um, yeah. In those very, very warm temperatures, the bridge metal can actually expand a little bit. So whenever the bridge is moving, um, the bridge can expand and actually get stuck together. So oh, often you'll see in the in the summer, if the bridges are moving for some reason, you'll see the uh, fire boat out hosing down the bridges. And that's not for a fire. That's just to cool or the cleaning. bridge or cleaning or <laughs> yeah. anything else. It's just to cool the bridge off so that it contracts a little bit so that oh, it can actually gosh. open. 
Michigan Avenue literally meets the sky when the bridges lift to accommodate sailboats and other tall vessels traveling between Lake Michigan and the Chicago River. The Michigan Avenue Bridge was the first double-deck, leaf-fixed, trunnion bascule bridge ever built, known worldwide as a Chicago-type bascule bridge. The motor powers a series of gears and it has a counterweight that continuously balances this span as it swings upward to let boat traffic through. It opens approximately 40 times a year from April to November. It's truly an engineering wonder, even today, and I can tell you it's really something to experience in person. So many people were inspired by the potential of the Chicago River years ago. The dynamic relationship between the city, its river, and its remarkable movable bridges continues today. Thanks for joining us on Museum Access, where every visit is an adventure. I'm Leslie Mueller. See you next time.